Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. If you have your Bibles there, you might want to open them up to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to be focusing on verse 32 through to 40, but just have them open to Hebrews 11. Or it'll already be pre-populated in the app, if you like. This morning, I'm going to be talking about Reframe Your Life. Now, why I want to talk about that is because there is this kind of thinking around today that's kind of permeated large sections of the church that says if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, then, then you should have a, a very particular type of life, um, one that kind of moves up and to the right all of the time. And if you don't, if you don't have this life that, that looks like it's hashtag blessed and you've got favour and everything's working the way you want it to, then then there's a problem and and the key to having this life is faith, right? Faith is the way we, we get this life. In that scheme of things, faith is seen as a way of us getting God to give us the life that we want rather than as a response to the life that God has simply called us to live, however it actually works out. And sometimes it isn't necessarily seen, that life, by anyone but God. And sometimes that life doesn't get any of the rewards we think we should get. Not while we're here, it's something that we can only look forward to much, much, much later. So you should be able to work out by now that this is probably not going to go where you think it's going to go when people normally wheel out Hebrews chapter 11. In fact, my wife said to me this morning, what are you preaching on? I said, Hebrews 11. And she goes, yeah, but an Adrian sermon? And I went, yes. Uh, I don't do it because I like to be contrary or different. I do it because, to be quite honest, as I sat there and looked at this, normally when we, when we wheel out this Hebrews chapter 11, it's, it's, you know, the greats of the faith, the heroes of the faith, and if you just had faith, then you could live this spectacular life too. But that's actually not the story. That's not how that story in Hebrews 11 goes, and it's not where that story goes. It's not the trajectory of it all. Yeah, it starts with all the big names, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, but it finishes with a bunch of unknowns, a group of people that no one's ever heard of before, people who never made it, people who were never blessed, people who were never had these life covered with favour, people who were imprisoned and tortured and murdered for their faith. And yet they, those unknowns, are all commended for the same thing as the greats of the faith, their faith. They're all commended for their faith. So let's have a look at this. And the first thing I want to say is this. We want to understand faith, we want to reframe our life, we need to realise that faith takes a long-term view of things. See, we're told something else about both groups, something we sometimes miss to make the story fit what we want it to say. Twice it says the same things, in verse 13 and 39. It says, they all lived by faith, they all remained faithful, and yet they did not receive the things promised. These were all commended for their faith, Yet none of them received what had been promised. Do you get that? They all lived by faith. They're all commended for their faith. And yet none of them received the things that were promised. Even the big names. This wasn't a case of them not getting from God something they wanted. This was a case of them not realising and getting something God had in fact promised to them. They moved in that direction but they only saw the answer to it from a great distance, we're told. Now, that raises a couple of issues, right? One is our here and now mindset that we have. You know, we have this really interesting dynamic in our household, and we have for many years. It's not what you might think of, you might, the most obvious thing you might think of, and the fact that I've been the only male in a house of five females for many years, although that is an interesting dynamic. Um, it's not bad, I love it. I love my wife, I love my girls, I love it. Sometimes I just don't understand what's going on. Um, and there have been times where Heather has said to me, aren't you going to get involved? And I'm going, I, I don't know what's happening. I just, I just don't know what's happening. But that's not the dynamic I'm talking about. The thing I'm talking about that in a household is that um, it, it centres around this issue of delayed gratification. 
See, my, don't moan, okay? <laughs> my wife and girls are people who have a philosophy of life that is, why put off to tomorrow what you can enjoy today, right? And, and I'm more of a, what's enjoyment? No, I'm more of a case of, <laughs> why enjoy today when you can put it off to tomorrow? See, I am someone who enjoys anticipation. Anyone else? Like, I like looking forward to something, right? I like the idea of, oh, I've got that to look forward to. And sometimes I'll put things off for quite some time because it's like I get to look forward to doing that thing. Well, where delayed gratification really pinches us as a family and has in the past is around Easter. Because what happens around Easter? Chocolate eggs, right? But in our family, it's lint bunnies, right? Who knows the lint bunnies? Okay, the little gold bunnies with a little red thing and a little gold bell, right? Okay, they're the ones. Soon as it's Easter Friday, it's a bunny massacre, right? There's gold wrapping and little golden bells and red ribbons lying all over the house. They're dead, but not me. I might snap the ears off and eat it and then crinkle my gold wrapper back over the bunny <laughs> and then go and put it somewhere where I think... I think no one's going to find it. And I come back to find that the bunny has decayed a little bit. His head is missing. And that only happens once. Thou dost protest too much. Okay. Anyway, my point is that to some extent, okay, we Christians are a bit like that as followers of Jesus. We, we don't need to wait for anything in our, this world today. It's our instant gratification world. The, the idea of delayed gratification is something we really struggle with. It's, we want it and we want it now. We don't want to put it off to the end. The problem with that is we're called to a, a much longer game than that as far as our faith goes about where all this is actually heading. See, we see faith as a thing that gets us the life we want now rather than the thing that keeps us going until then when we inherit everything that we've been promised, which may not be in this life. And we've lost sight of the fact that our ultimate reward is in heaven. We want heaven here and now. We want, we want the, the perfection, the provision, the freedom from all the pain and all the bad stuff. And to some extent, you know, we can get some of that stuff now because in Jesus, the kingdom of God has come. Heaven has invaded earth and there's sometimes, in some ways, that is actually present and available to us, but not fully right now. And so the idea that we might just have to wait and stay the course and run the race even when the things we want or the things we think we should have are not happening to us is not something that we necessarily want to hear. Now, I think there's been a really good corrective to that over the years and it's not all pie in the sky when we die stuff these days. You know, there was a day where this life was kind of just, in Christian terms, was, was really just viewed as flyover territory, you know, something we need to endure because, you know, it's okay when we get to heaven, everything's going to be all right. And I think that's robbed us of something of the joy of this life. This life is a gift, yes, right? This life is a gift and, and we should suck the marrow out of this life. We should enjoy it. But this life is not all there is and we kind of walk a bit of a tightrope in terms of balancing and understanding that. And one day it really will all be wonderful. One day it really all will be perfect. One day he will wipe every tear from our eye. We'll get the stuff we've been looking forward to and all creation will actually be restored. But that one day is a distant horizon and that's what we should be looking forward to. Our eternal hope is something that's in the future. It's not in the stuff that's here and now. See, the clue is in the first verse of Hebrews. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. He's talking about that ultimate future and knowing the difference between getting there and dropping out of the race when things don't going uh, is got to going our way is is the difference in all of that that's the thing that de determines whether or not we actually stay the course or whether we fall away the other thing is that when we understand faith like this it reframes or normalizes our failure for want of a better term how many times have you worked up your faith and hoped and prayed for something and then it's never ever come off anyone I mean, it's happened to me so many times I could write books and do conferences on it. I don't know many people would want to come, but I could do the How Not to Get What You Want conference. Yeah, Faith as Failure conference, come along. I, you know, I'd, I've had it so many times. We've all been there, right? You might be there now. And what do we do? We see it as some sort of failure. We see it as some sort of failure on, on our part that maybe, you know, I didn't have enough faith. And I mean, I don't know 
how we're supposed to quantify faith these i don't know how you're supposed to quantify faith at all really but but it's like i haven't got enough faith or i didn't persist long enough or there was something that was actually wrong in my life that caused a blockage and and you know to be fair sometimes there are things in our life that do get in the way and the lord wants to deal with that and if we ask he will tell us but but sometimes it's not a failure on our part and if it doesn't come through sometimes we see it as a failure on god's part that that he he doesn't want to or he he can't or he won't do this thing that we ask him to do and it leads to disappointment and disillusionment and bitterness and i've just seen so many people fall away because their life has not worked out the way they wanted it to work out and they thought that their faith in god was the mechanism by which they would achieve that but for the most part it's not failure on anyone's part ours or god's it's just the tension of living in the now not yet of the kingdom as I said, in Jesus, the kingdom has come. It's come in part, but not yet fully. His will is done on earth, just not as it is in heaven at this point. And one day it will be because earth and heaven will be one and the same thing, right? That's where all this is heading. So we seek and we ask and we work f- towards that kingdom to come more and more, but we do so understanding that those breakthroughs will always be in part and never in full. And that sometimes those things look like failures but they're not failures they're just not yet as per my last point so our faith and persistence through it all is never in vain god has planned something better for us all we're told in verse 40 real faith is defined by real faithfulness to keep going and believing and hoping even when nothing is going the way we think that it should that is how real faith is defined we need to plow on number two faith is what we do not how much we believe i'm going to read from verse 32 and what more shall i say i do not have time to tell about gideon barak samson jephthah about david samuel and their prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms administered justice and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Okay, so a couple of things about this. Faith is a response, right? Now, all these people that just mentioned, they responded in faith to what God had actually called them to do. And they got some breakthrough and they had some success. Not, in, not completely, but they had some. But it was their response to what God had called them to do, not something that they actually initiated. So there's this really misunderstood and misplaced phrase Uh, in this passage in verse 33 it says who through faith right who through faith there's a lot of crazy stuff done by people who think that through faith they can do all sorts of things there have been true these are true stories people who think that they can walk on water and they've tried and they've drowned people who feel who genuinely believe through faith they can run through brick walls i don't know what the point of that is but people have genuinely tried it and filmed themselves doing it. I don't know, is that like a slam dunk for the existence of God or something, you know? You'll definitely believe in God when I run through this brick wall. Will I? Or will I just feel like you're a complete idiot, mate, right? Who's ending up in hospital for what he's doing. But people do it. People handle snakes and drink poison. People refuse medical advice because through faith, they actually believe they can be healed. They name it and claim it because they believe if you believe it enough, you can manifest it and so on and so on and so on. You've heard about it. If we just have enough faith, we can do anything. And Jesus says, you know, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be uprooted and throw yourself into the sea. It's true. We need to have faith for things to happen. But, but here's what I want us to understand. Faith doesn't begin with us it is a response to god's will and god's word romans 10 17 says this faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of god where does faith come from hearing the word of god the word that paul uses in 10 17 is the word rhema so quick greek lesson here there are two greek words for word one is logos one is rhema logos is kind of a logic a principle a reason it specifically refers to the timeless truths. We often use to, to refer to the Bible, the written word of God. The second word is rhema. That is a more contemporary spoken word, a particular thing to you and to your time and place. And that is the word that Paul uses in 1017. Faith comes from hearing and hearing a word of God. The thing that God actually speaks to you and calls you to. Faith is a response to something that God speaks to us. Now you take that example of Peter walking on water. 
When Peter saw Jesus walking on water, he just didn't get out of the boat and go, I've got enough faith to do that as well. What did he say? Lord, if that is you, tell me to come. And Jesus said to him, come. And in response to being summoned by Jesus, Peter got out of the boat and walked on water, at least for a while, right? You with me? There were other guys in that boat. If they had said, well, if Jesus can do it and Peter can do it, I'm going to believe I can do it too, but did not respond to a word that they had been given... It just would have been the Jesus and Peter show from that point on. The other guys would have been at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, right? They wouldn't have been able to do it because they weren't responding in faith. They were trying to work it up and initiate it. You see the difference? Faith is a response to something God speaks to us, not something that we initiate. Now, you can't have faith for something that God has not said, not in this sense. You can have hope. That's a different thing and that's fine. But you can only have faith in response to something that God speaks to you. Right, so all of these people in Hebrews 11 are commended for their faith in responding obediently to what God told them to do, not what they were able to manifest through their belief. The other thing is, is this, that God meets us at our point of faith as well. Not all of these people in Hebrew, Hebrews 11, this great big list of people, had exactly the same kind of faith, right? When God spoke to them and told them to do something, some of them went absolutely sure and off they went and did it, while others of them had a little more of a reluctant and even hesitant response. I mean, just look at the first three that are mentioned here, Gideon, Barak and Samson. I mean, when Gideon is found, he's hiding, he's hiding in a threshing um, vat, hiding from the Midianites when an angel turns up to him and says, greetings, man of valour great warrior, brave man, you're going to lead your people to overthrow the Midianites. And you're like, no, I'm hiding, right? I'm hiding. So he takes a little bit of coaxing to, no, dude, you're going to do this. Uh, and Gideon's like, I'm pretty sure you got the wrong address. Like, really, you didn't want Gabriel? Because, like, he pumps weights and everything. Like, he's more the guy you need to be going for. No, no, no. No, it's Gideon. Like, no, you're going to do it. And even after that, Gideon, what's Gideon doing when God tells him to do? Can I just make sure I've heard that correctly? I'm going to put this fleece out, right? And if it's wet, uh, if it's dry and not wet and vice versa. Yeah, so there's this reluctance. But you know what I love about that? God was just happy to meet him at where his faith was, yes? God didn't go to him, oh man, I can't believe that your faith is so weak that you can't just get up and do the thing I've told you to do. It's like, you need it, I'm going to give that to you. That's fine. Barak was the same. He was told by, by Deborah, who was one of the judges of Israel, you're going to lead Israel into battle and you're, God's going to give you a great victory and you're going to be like lionized for it. You're going to be lauded. For, you're going to be this hero. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do it, except I need you to come with me. And Deborah's like, yeah, but if I come with you, you're not going to get the glory. And he goes, I don't care. I just want you to come with me. So they do it. Deborah gets the glory in the end. And again, God did what he said he was going to do. Barak responded in faith. But it wasn't the kind of faith that God was looking for. He just, I want you to do this, Barak. I want you to do this. But he's like, I need Deborah to come with me. And God said, okay, if that's what you need, that's what you need. Now, the Samson stories, well, you know, who's read Judges, the book of Judges, right? Samson's, Samson's a bit of a nightmare, right? Just because something's in the Bible doesn't mean that God commends it to us or that we should copy it, right? Um, there's, there's a way of understanding how we read the Bible and interpret it, right? There's a reason we don't sell what would Samson do merchandise, <laughs> all right? Because the guy, yeah, just not okay. But, but, when push comes to shove and he realises he needs to get his act together, he does what he needs to do and he responds obediently and faithfully and God meets him at that point. Now, David, Samuel and the prophets, yeah, they were a little more confident in their faith, but it doesn't mean that they got it right all the time, does it? Sometimes they got it wrong and God met them at their point of faith as well. So there's this bit of spectrum of faith. Even some of the big names had their wobbly moments. Abraham, Moses, they all had their moments of doubt as well. But my point is God was gracious and he meets us where we're at. If the best they could do was, yeah, I'll do it, but I need more proof, then he gave them more proof. If the best that someone could do is, I'll do it, but I need someone to come with me, then he lets someone come with them. I think that's why Jesus says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you don't need to feel it, you just need to do it, because faith is seen in what we do, not what we feel. 
right? It's in what we do. So you just have to have enough faith to do the thing that God has asked you to do. That's all. Just enough faith to, to take that step. Just enough faith to do that tiny little thing. Just that faith to keep going, especially when you don't feel like it. Just enough faith to step out of the boat, even though you're not sure that you won't sink. Just enough. That's all you need. Just enough to be able to do the thing and respond in obedience to what God has called you to do. But let me finish this by saying that faith is as active in private as it is in public. In verse 35, it says, Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to believe, uh, be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced years and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goats skins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, that so only together with us would they be made perfect. And I want you to notice the change in the language here from these very specific individual big names of the faith down to this very generic women and others. So we go from all these big names down to this just generic, these collective terms. There were these other people who lived by faith as well. And they're not the marquee players, right? They're not the people we all know about, the people that we're told to aspire to. They are anonymous masses of people over history. We don't know them. We don't know their stories. Most people don't know them and don't know their stories. It was all done in secret, in isolation. And yet they are honoured as heroes of the faith. They might not be known to us, but they are definitely known to God. And we seem to, to live in a world that just seems to be absolutely addicted to status and celebrity and fame and making a no name for ourselves. I mean, you can just be an everyday person who goes on some sort of banal TV show like my hamster is stalking me and then you end up as a celebrity D-lister on, you know, celebrity carpet cleaning or something. You know what I mean? It's just got absolutely ridiculous. Everyone seems to want their 15 minutes of fame and the church is actually not immune to that either. The church has its own culture of celebrityism where we make celebrities and names out of people who occupy stages and in front of lights and we release albums and stuff like that. And the bigger the platform and the bigger audience you get, the more famous you become. And we think, and we're told in some respects, that faith is a thing that puts us on that trajectory. The problem with that is that kind of becomes the goal, doesn't it? Become, faith becomes the means and getting up on stage and getting in front of the lights and the audience and having the name and the, the crowds, I mean, that, that's the goal and that's not the goal at all. I was going to do a sermon one day called Why I Still Empty the Bins. <laughs> a whole sermon on that. That's pretty riveting stuff, isn't it? Why I Still Empty the Bins. But there's a reason why I still empty the bins. And that's because I follow a Jesus who didn't think it above himself to wash his disciples' feet. And I don't see how we can, we can have a type of Christianity that outgrows the need to have that type of humble service, regardless of what you do. I think the minute that you get too big to empty the bins, you get too big to be on the path of discipleship. Because, I mean, if Jesus didn't hesitate to wash disciples' feet, at what point do we get too big to do that sort of stuff? I'm not saying we can't be busy and have other things to do. I do. But I'm not above I won't wash your feet, trust me, I will not touch your feet. But I'll empty the bins, right? I'll empty, that'd be a bit weird, wouldn't it? Be a bit creepy if I said, hey, can I wash your feet? We do safe church training around here and there's... I don't want to report, right? But I'll empty the bins. Anyway, my point is this. Are you okay with being one of the generic others? Are you okay forever being someone who's never known, who never has a name, who never has a reputation, who's just 
one of those multiple thousands of people, millions of people over history, who are commended for their faith, but no one knows who they are. Are you okay with being that person? We have not been called to fame. We've been called to faithfulness. Faithfulness. And sometimes all faithfulness gets you is torture, imprisonment, chains, jeering, flogging, being sawed into, stoned, homeless, destitute, living in a hole in the ground. I'm really selling it now, aren't I? Who wants, to, who wants to sign up for a life of faithfulness today? My point is it's not always up and to the right. It doesn't always get you the bigger, more blessed, as we define it, life. Sometimes it leads us into some really tough places and it leads us into anonymity and no one else knows what's going on for us. Look, it's unlikely to ever be that bad for us, but you never know. But are you content to be unknown and be in the background? Are you content with the fact that the life that you have right now is the only life you're ever going to have. Success in terms of making a name for ourselves and achieving things, I mean, that's fine. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. People work hard to do all that sort of stuff. That's, that's absolutely fine. But it's not the thing that determines whether or not our life has been well lived. Faithfulness is. Whether or not we have been faithful to live the life that Jesus has called us to live, irrespective of where that leads us. For some people, it might lead to bigger and better things. For some of us, it doesn't. But are we okay not to be famous, but to be known simply for being faithful? Some of us need to stop buying into the cultural lies that our life is less than because it's not like some of these other people. And we need to reframe our life and see that every aspect of it is an opportunity and expression of our faith and an opportunity to be faithful in the small, unseen, unappreciated things. Every aspect of our life. And we need to learn to reevaluate our lives in terms of of eternity, not just temporal success, because eternity is where it's going to come to light. You know, in eternity, I don't know how it all works, but I do know that there will be people there that will be getting some of the biggest props and we've never even heard of them because they have lived the most faithful lives. They probably didn't get any of the fame, any of the fortune, any of the recognition but they live faithfully and God saw that and God will reward that in the end. Faithfulness requires that we live obediently to what God has called us to do, to run the race that has been marked out for us. Not for someone else, for us. Whether anyone else sees it, notices it or appreciates it or not. Faithfulness is simply living obediently to God where you are now. It is being kind, it is being loving, it is being generous, it is serving others. It's being a person of character, it's being a good boss or a good employee, it's being all the things God calls us to be everywhere, all the time, irrespective of whether anyone else sees it or recognises it or not. That's the life of faith that leads to faithfulness. Amen.